Um, I'm going to talk about the cyber knife um, and clinically implementing that in your center. Um, disclosure, I have received honoraria and travel expenses from Accuray in the past, but not uh, for the AAPM meeting uh, this year. Um, what I intend to cover in the next 30 minutes is a, a very brief overview of the CyberKnife, what it is, how it works, a little bit about the uniqueness of site planning for um, a CyberKnife. We'll talk about commissioning, ongoing QA, and what equipment you need, both what, what you need to supply, what Accuray supplies, and other equipment from other vendors that I find to be very helpful for a comprehensive QA um, program on a cyber knife. All right. I hope that most of you were able to get to um, the session yesterday where Dave Shepard reviewed the, the uh, cyber knife technology in more detail, because um, this will be a very brief uh, reminder that the cyber knife is basically a 6MV Linac uh, mounted on an industrial robot that's normally used for making cars. Obviously, this gives then the the robot six degrees of freedom of motion to move the x-ray beam around the patient, and the, reprodu the reproducibility of the uh, robot is specced at uh, 0.2 millimeters. And the overall um, treatment delivery accuracy has been confirmed as submillimeter by many, many centers uh, using the MD Anderson uh, SRS Phantom. Um, the CyberKnife allows 1,200 to 5,000, depending on which generation of machine you have, uh, possible angles of beam incidence around the patient. All of the, well, the beams are non-coplanar, and they can be not, they are usually non-isocentric, although you can deliberately plan them to be isocentric for um, cases where a spherical dose distribution is desired. Unique to the CyberKnife is the fact that it has an image guidance system that tracks detects and actually feeds back to the robot to correct for any patient motion or internal organ motion, and this goes on throughout treatment. It's not just bef before treatment starts um, and after treatment is finished, it's throughout treatment. Um, and the CyberKnife is uh, designed and approved for SRS and SBRT anywhere in the body. Um, probably many of you have seen this slide a lot of, in a lot of presentations. The components of the image guidance system are shown in yellow and the uh, delivery system in blue. So the image guidance system, we have conventional x-ray tubes up in the ceiling, and they are oriented at 45 degrees to the vertical, so 90 degrees to each other. Um, the image detectors on the uh, latest generation machines are in the floor. Uh, straightforward amorphous silicon um, detectors. Uh, the synchrony camera up here, this bar contains three optical uh, cameras that are used for treating lesions that move with, re with uh, respiration. Um, the delivery system, as I mentioned earlier, the accelerator, the robot, and the couch. The CyberKnife is um, fairly unique in that it has a, a multitude of tracking modes for different uh, treatment sites. Uh, the first is fiducial tracking. I trust you're all familiar with the uh, gold fiducials that are commonly used for um, on, on many different types of radiation oncology systems today. Um, there's a tracking mode for fiducial tracking for lesions that are not affected by res respiration and a separate tracking mode for uh, lesions that are affected by respiration, for example, lung lesions or uh, pancreas, kidney, liver. Low density, uh, fiducials are used in low density where there is insufficient contrast uh, between the, the lesion and its surrounding tissue to be able to pick it out in the uh, real-time images. When we are able to determine uh, density differences between the lesion and its surround, then the CyberKnife is capable of doing density tracking. And that is applied to all intracranial uh, lesions uh, through skull tracking, basically by looking at the uh, different radiographic densities of bone and sinuses um, and the outer contour, obviously, of the skull um, to derive um, 6D corrections that are fed back to the robot. 
Um, there is spine tracking that um, allows for deformable re registration. So this is, whereas skull tracking is assuming rigid body uh, geometry, spine tracking allows for uh, deformation and includes that in the tracking system. And finally, um, there, there's the ability for some lung lesions that are of sufficiently large size. Um, the, the line is 15 millimeters or, or greater in all uh, three principal axes. And it also has to be of sufficient density um, to be, uh, again, picked out of the real-time images. Now this is just, oh, sorry. This is a movie, which may or may not run. There we go. Okay. Just a, a quick sum of how the machine works. So we start by taking a CT data set. Um, Typically, we'll take 300 slices or more, very thin slices, 1 to 1.5 millimeter slice thickness. Uh, we obviously also will acquire uh, PET-CT or MR if that's helpful for the case. Um, the uh, planning system calculates DRRs under the geometry of the uh, imaging system on the CyberKnife. DRRs show on the operator's console over to the left. And once the plan is developed, the patient is brought to the room, lies on a table. Initial imaging is done, and the couch moves in order to get um, alignment between the, uh, the real-time images and the DRRs. So lining the patient up exactly as he or she was in CT. That's the last time the couch is moved, generally speaking, unless the um, motion of the patient or internal motion exceeds the ability of the uh, robot to uh, correct. So now the couch is stationary, and um, again, another set of images is taken. Um, the robot made a correction on the basis of those initial images. Then the beam comes on. Before the robot moves to its next position, another pair of images is obtained. Uh, the new correction is inferred mathematically before the next beam comes on, and so on throughout treatment. Um, if the, if the uh, motion of the patient does exceed uh, the tolerances of the robot's ability to correct, um, then the uh, system will shut down and the operator, the therapist, has to get involved. For example, if a patient coughs or something, um, usually the therapist can just uh, take another. This is showing how the non-coplanar um, beams add up to nicely covering a paraspinal uh, target. And then that's it. Okay. Oops. Now when I'm trying to go on, I can't. Yeah, I'm trying. Let me try that. Nope. Gee. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I, I was trying to go. There you go. Okay, thanks. Oops. Oh, we're back to the movie. <laughs> All right. Um, the collimators on the CyberKnife are either fixed collimators um, that range in size, as I say down here, from five millimeters up to six centimeters in diameter. Um, and uh, the newest systems have a motorized collimator called the IRIS, which um, is, uh, you can see it at the uh, Accuray booth here. Um, it basically, by putting two hexagonal um, banks of collimators on top of each other and rotating them relative to each other, you get a 12-sided polygon, which approximates a circle quite nicely. Um, the, the iris collimator um, 
is set to only provide this exactly the same uh, diameters as are available on the fixed collimators. And all of the collimator changing is done automatically under robot control. Alrighty, now to move on to the initial problem that you'll face, site planning. Um, since the cyber knife can point the x-ray beam virtually anywhere around the room, you have to consider all walls as primary barriers, just about. Um, their, their Accuray has a very valuable white paper, um, as, as Tim said, Varian does too, that, that steps you through um, your shielding calculations very, very clearly um, so that you won't be making any mistakes. Um, right now, the, the beam can only be aimed 22 degrees below the horizontal, which in many um, facilities will mean that the, the primary beam doesn't hit the ceiling or the roof. Um, but I do encourage you to consider shielding the entire roof the same as the walls because um, there's been uh, talk for a long time about uh, uh, providing beams that go uh, almost to a PA, uh, a PA approach to the patient. So be prepared for future upgrades. And um, the last point on this slide, I, I also encourage you don't use old work, workload numbers um, because Accuray has been uh, increasing the number of monitor units per minute, the output of the accelerator. When I installed my first cyber knife, um, we were at 400 monitor units a minute. Now we're up to 800 monitor units a minute, and they'll be going to 1,000 shortly. So bear in mind that Accuray is uh, working on all kinds of levels, including treatment planning and um, the path that the robot walks, and they're doing everything they can to minimize treatment time so that your workload... Um, uh, will go up, and certainly has gone up by more than a factor of two in my experience. Just the introduction of the iris collimator and the new 3.5 um, multiplan and the what they call optimized path traversal has, uh, uh, according to users, um, uh, decreased treatment time by a factor of two to three. So... Bear that in mind when you uh, do your shielding calculations and use the newest workload data that's available at the time of purchase. Um, this shows a typical cyber knife layout. You obviously can appreciate that all of the wall thicknesses are equal um, because they're all obviously being uh, ready for primary and also being exposed to the same leakage and scatter. Um, otherwise, your room is pretty similar to any other room. You have wall lasers, sagittal laser, um, closed circuit TV cameras and so on. I like to design uh, cyber knife rooms that don't have a maze, just beef up the door, but obviously this one has a maze. These walls, as an example, are five feet concrete. I'm not sure in this, in this uh, whether this was high density concrete assumed or, or not, but five feet. Um, so that's typical of the thickness that, that you'll need. Um, the control room, there's nothing special. It's very similar to any other uh, isocentric LINAC control room. And in fact, there are only three um, monitors that the therapist is watching during treatment. Um, and rather than the many more that we've all seen around uh, IMRT machines. And don't forget to include the equipment room. This is a photograph over here of an equipment room that includes all the computers... Um, uh, yeah, the primary computer, which is an SGI, uh, the computer that controls uh, respiratory motion tracking, the robot computer, uh, and others. Obviously, you have these are the controls uh, for the uh, linear accelerator itself. You have a chiller. Uh, you have a power distribution unit, and so on. So you have to create. Remember to uh, set aside space for this equipment room. This example just shows um, that you can put a cyber knife also into a uh, room, that, a vault that was designed for a uh, high energy LINAC. Um, where I am now in Tampa actually, <laughs> and perhaps most many people are doing this, the, uh, the investors wanted to hedge their bets uh, so that if in future uh, CyberKnife dies, they could always, always put in a uh, high-energy accelerator into this vault. 
commissioning. Um, I'm assuming that we've gone through acceptance testing already, which uh, takes about two days. Obviously, you're trying to demonstrate that the machine meets the specifications uh, that were agreed upon um, during uh, when you uh, sign the purchase agreement. It's fairly straightforward. Um, when we start off with commissioning, um, number one is making sure that your laser, the laser that is... Uh, pointing at the center of the x-ray beam, or designed to point at the center of the x-ray beam. It comes down the collimator with a mirror system. Uh, the coincidence of, of uh, the alignment of that laser with the center of the radiation field. I have estimated times over here. These are um, times that originally came from Accuray, and I modified a few of them naturally upwards um, based on my own experience. Um, beam data collection for the ray tracing algorithm. There are two there are two algorithms, Monte Carlo and ray tracing. Um, the measurements that you need to, to do are TPR for each fixed uh, and mobile collimator diameter. Um, and that can be done using the robot to change the distance, you know, using a, uh, a scanner to change the depth of your detector and the robot to change the distance to the water surface. It's a, it's a primary TMR measurement, not a percent depth dose that's converted. And I think that's important because uh, for these very small field sizes, like five millimeters, the, the um, calculation, the conversion from percent depth dose to TMR is certainly not well uh, understood. Um, OCRs, profiles, need to be obtained for each collimator size at five depths that are given here. So you need a scanner that will allow you to scan to 30 centimeters. And output factors, which again, I, I uh, echo what uh, Paula and Tim said, the most difficult of the measurements to be done. Output factors for the CyberKnife need to be obtained at three different SADs for each collimator size. So at three SADs for all 12 collimators, fixed collimators, and for all 12 collimator settings on the iris. Um, estimated time to complete that is 66 hours depends on what your work week is. Um, additional uh, beam data collection that has to be done for the Monte Carlo algorithm, you need in-air in output factor measurements. I should mention the Monte Carlo algorithm that's Im implemented in uh, CyberKnife uh, was written by Charlie Ma. Um, it requires in-air measurements, beam profiles with no secondary collimator at 80 centimeters from the target, um, at a depth that's slightly uh, greater than Dmax. And then percent depth doses for the uh, Monte Carlo algorithm, again, for the same depth range, uh, for the 60 millimeter collimator at 80 centimeters SSD. Estimated time to acquire these data is seven hours. And I, I have a note down here. Um, that Accurate, you don't have to call your friend down the street who has one because Accurate provides cumulative data that have been measured for all other centers that have the same model that you have. And that's with respect to everything, the TPRs, the OCRs, uh, the in-air profiles, and, and everything, so that you can immediately compare your data um, against the uh, data that all other users have, have collected, which are very, very tight, I might mention. Um, they, they're very, very tight, regardless of, of what parameter you're looking at. Um, from one machine to another, the reproducibility is almost uncanny. Um, so those data are available, and if you have a problem where your data don't agree with um, the cumulative data, then in my experience, Accuray uh, Physics is there to help you. They just jump right in and try to help you figure out what's wrong. So don't, don't uh, hold off on, on trying to seek help um, from the physics team at Accuray. Um, in addition to the beam data collection that you need to do to commission your treatment planning system, um, I, I have in here, don't forget your imaging scanners, that you have to get that evaluation done also before treating your first patient. So you want to uh, scan appropriate phantoms on all CT uh, scanners, and I would say uh, as MR scanners and PET CT as well, but every one that's going to be used for treatment planning. I know where I am. Oh, my goodness. 
where I am, um, I have probably 15 different imaging centers, soon to be more, that are uh, sending data for cyber knife treatment plans. So that's not an insignificant amount of work. Obviously, you have to determine the uh, CT number electron density relationship, uh, confirm the geometric accuracy of your scanners, and um, conf confirm the accuracy of fusion. I, I estimated that as eight hours per scanner. Um, Another step, obviously, that we all have to go through is validating the beam data by confirming the measured and the reference beam data, the d reference beam data in your treatment planning system after it's been imported with the actual measured data. A couple of hours there. For the ray tracing algorithm, um, I think you need to do many end-to-end -end tests. There are so many combinations and permutations um, on the cyber knife, and you want to verify the accuracy of both absolute dose delivery and the relative, relative dose distribution in both the high and low dose regions. And this has to be done for all collimators, conformal and isocentric plans, and all of those tracking modes that, that we looked at before. I say one to two weeks here. That's, uh, that's very long work weeks um, because this, I think, is extremely important to, uh, before you treat your first patient. For Monte Carlo, there's, there's more work to be done. You have to generate a source uh, model, which is basically determining your energy spectrum, source distribution, and fluence distribution. Calc time on that is, is not long, but you want to review and approve, and again, Accuray will provide uh, data from other centers so you can see if your, if your spectrum is, is reasonable or not. Um, again, you need to compare measured data and calculated data for TPRs and OCRs for every collimator, both the motorized and the fixed. This is five to ten days calculation time, but it's only six to eight hours where, where you have to actually be interacting with the system. But um, commissioning Monte Carlo is, is, you have to tell your administrators and your, uh, your uh, neurosurgeons who will be breathing down your neck, this is time consuming. And then finally you need to generate a normalization factor that basically takes, converts deposited energy into absorbed dose, and that's a 48 hour computation time. So expand your, expand your thinking if, if uh, your, your center intends to do a lot of lung treatment right from the get go. Um, commissioning the multi-plan treatment planning system um, you want to compare results under idealized beam geometry for every collimator setting. Compare results for plans for the most common disease sites you intend to treat, including isocentric and conformal plans, small and large collimators, homogeneous and heterogeneous cases, and obviously resolve all discrepancies. Three days is probably an underestimate there. And as far as commissioning goes, I don't think you're done until you have independent extramural confirmation of your system's accuracy. And if there's anything, at I, when, when I was installing my first CyberKnife, um, we had meetings every week with all of the stakeholders, the neurosurgeons, the administrators, the radiation oncologists, the thoracic surgeons, the uh, urologists, everyone. Um, and at every meeting, I, I would underline that we can't treat our first patient until we had feedback from the MD Anderson um, physics folks that uh, we had met the criteria um, that they apply for the uh, SRS phantom. And surely enough, when, when it comes time to treat our first, well, when commissioning is finished and Accuray says, you know, it's in your hands, sign, sign here and give us the money, uh, you know, the last check, um, then... They, everyone seems to forget about the admonition, we have to wait till we have MD Anderson uh, confirmation. Um, but I insisted on it, and, and fortunately the physicians with whom I was working there um, uh, abided by their promise. And about six months into our treatment was when there was a uh, misadministration, which probably most of you are aware of, at, a, at another facility in uh, Florida where uh, on a Novalis system, 77 patients were overdosed by 150%. And at that point, um, the neurosurgeons and the administrators and everybody um, uh, came by to, uh, you know, kiss my ring. <laughs> Didn't get a raise, but uh, a lot of, a lot of um, thanks. So I, I strongly encourage you not to treat your first patient until you have this. All righty.
Now, routine QA, this I know is a really busy slide. Um, this is what Accuray recommends be done. Um, I think it's a little bit um, inadequate, but for daily checks, uh, safety interlocks, um, readings of, of uh, voltages and currents, uh, the, an output constancy test, um, a check of, that the robot's perch position is, is uh, accurate and the laser is pointing at the right point, an X-ray two warm up, and an AQA test, which I'll talk about in a, a few seconds. This is really a variant of the Winston, Winston Lutz test. And then they uh, obviously have recommendations on measurements to be made monthly, uh, quarterly, annually, and after any uh, upgrade. I won't dwell on those. Patient-specific QA obviously um, has to be done, and it's non-trivial, as you've heard from the previous speakers. We want to ensure that the treatment plan generated is actually delivered. Uh, ideally, we want to check both absolute dose and, the, and relative dose distribution, both in the regions to be treated and the regions to be spared. Clearly, an EPID amorphous silicon type detector is inappropriate for CyberKnife because the beam is moving all over the place and the images are fixed in the floor. Um, Film-based film dosimetry is certainly a, a possible approach. Ion chamber measurement for absolute dose, um, I'll caution you on that in a minute. Obviously, you can use diodes as well for relative uh, you know, at, to an ion chamber. And a stereotactic diode array is another possible approach. Um, I'd like to talk about specific equipment that you'll need um, to get started. Um, I say here two farmer chambers, one that will be used for daily output checks and another one that will be a physics uh, chamber uh, used for um, monthly or weekly output checks. Obviously an electrometer, a variety of diodes, um, again, Accuray will recommend specific manufacturers and, and models for these um, based on their experience, and that, as, as Tim said, uh, Varian does. You'll need at least one SRS ion chamber, probably, but uh, Bruce Curran, who is here, he walked in before, um, just told me that uh, CG51 is going to, uh, apparently is discussing coming out with a formal recommendation not to use chambers like the A16 chamber for absolute dosimetry um, because KQ becomes variable. So um, um, be mindful of that and keep your eyes on, on task 51. Fortunately, with the CyberKnife, we have a 6 centimeter diameter uh, field to which we can normalize everything. So it's a far more, it's a far larger field than one has, say, on the gamma knife or, uh, well, on, on, um, on Novalis, you could get to a 10 by 10. Um, I, obviously you need a scanner, um, a small water phantom, and all of these other things. What, uh, what Accuray supplies is quite a robust set of equipment. Um, possibly the most important is what they refer to as the birdcage. It's a, a thing that rigidly mounts to the um, collimator uh, accessory, and um, you can put an, ion an ionization chamber in there for morning output checks very simply, and I'll show you you can also use it for other things. The AQA Phantom, they, I'm sorry I don't have a photograph of it, it's just a, a, a plastic cube. It's it's where it is an adaptation of Winston Lust, 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 Lutz, where um, basically uh, the therapist uh, will irradiate it with an AP and a lateral beam every morning, and it's looking at the, uh, the centeredness of an internal target within the radiation field. It takes about 10 minutes, and it does give you con some confidence in the spatial accuracy and robot calibration each day before you start off. And again, Accuray supplies film analysis software for this. I do use ImageJ quite a bit, um, as Dr. Petty mentioned she does, but Accuray supplies a lot of film analysis software with what comes with the machine. This again is supplied by Accuray. Um, it contains um, inserts like this. Uh, that can accommodate orthogonal uh, radiochromic film. Um, uh, it also contains fiducials. This can be used for checking fiducial tracking, skull tracking, and spine tracking, this particular phantom. 
It's obviously anthropomorphic and has uh, heterogeneities in it. I think it's made by CIRS. They also provide two respiratory tracking phantoms with the, with the system. Um, this one, uh, you can see there is heterogeneity in this thorax. Uh, there's a motor that moves uh, uh, a lesion in and out of the uh, phantom, and it has uh, lights that are used for um, tracking. These are placed on the patient's chest, so you can uh, irradiate again a film inside this phantom and convince yourself that you do, you are achieving, uh, you're putting the dose where you intend to. I'm going to stop there because I'm over, ti over time, unfortunately. Um, I have, and you'll see this online, you can go online. I've suggested equipment from other vendors um, that I use. It's not intended to be uh, a recommendation, but these are just examples. If you go out on the floor, you'll see lots of different types of, of um, equipment that could be used uh, for uh, these applications. Um, one thing that wasn't, well, that needs to be men mentioned with, uh, with this machine is Accuray doesn't give you anything specifically to test, quantitatively test the imaging system. So I purchased this from Standard Imaging, which is just a, a standard a KV image test module that they mount at 45 degree angles so that uh, it is uh, amenable to the CyberKnife geometry. Um, I think you know you need quantitative information in order to convince your field service engineer that your uh, your imaging system has has gone down the toilet. And if you have those images, it speaks uh, like nothing else. Um, this profiler uh, was just uh, I think just recently re released by Sun Nuclear. Very helpful. Um, they're also looking at adapting their Arc Phantom for uh, CyberKnife applications and other SRS applications. And I encourage you to have a, uh, keep your eyes open for Task Group 135, which is QA for Robotic Radio Surgery, chaired by Sonia Dietrich. And the estimated completion date, which is still online, is 1231.09. So by the end of this year, uh, hopefully you'll be able to access that document. And I will uh, stop there, and I, I recommend that uh, for the rest of my talk, you just go to the... Uh, to the website, the AAPM website. Thank you. Um, if folks are willing to stay on, since this is the last session of the day, I would invite the uh, speakers to come up to the podium and we'll entertain questions if there are any. I have a question and a clarification. No, uh, additional information. I'm a firm believer in learning from people's mistakes. And if you have radioactive sources, you can, um, that's reportable to the NRC. But if you have Linux, it's not reportable to anybody but your state and not really available for people to look at. So um, Mary Ellen mentioned the um, problem in Florida. And if anyone's interested, I can tell you what happened in Florida because I was asked in some capacity to look at it. Those folks used an Excel spreadsheet to do their absolute calibration. Somebody modified this Excel spreadsheet so that there was no percent depth dose factor in it. So whereas they put their chamber at 10 centimeters, as TG51 instructs, they did not incorporate the percent depth dose at 10 centimeters in calibrating the machine. The spreadsheet so, was unprotected, actually, and they overwrote a formula, right, in a cell? Yeah. So as Mary Ellen pointed out, if they would have even had somebody at their own site independently check that, or use the RPC Phantom, um, they could have caught that, and unfortunately they didn't, they didn't catch it on, in time. But that's why at my place we use spreadsheets only as a secondary check, and you have to do the math by hand as your primary, <laughs> primary math. Other questions for any of the speakers? I had one question regarding the uh, output factors that you've at either the site remeasured and they were co more correct. Um, what was the reason or the, the cause of that first error, erroneous data? I don't know. I didn't ask. But there's two common causes. You use the wrong detector and or it's not centered properly. Those are the two common causes. Uh, that's a question for Mary Ellen. I was wondering in SBRT with the CyberKnife, do you ever use or do you have to use the mobilization, patient mobilization systems, or do you not use anything? 
We don't use anything. Um, uh, uh, the patient just lies. Patient comfort is key so that they're not squirming. I mean, that's, that's the primary thing. Um, they're lying on a two-inch thick mattress with a pillow under their head for most SBRT applications. And um, uh, they're just, we put something under their knees if, if they want it to take uh, pressure off their lower back. Uh, patient comfort is the key uh, thing. Because treatments on the cyber knife, at least the generation that I have, t typically take an hour. Just to follow on, you may have seen from one of my slides, we take a different approach at UT Southwestern. They're highly immobilized. Not to the point of pain, just severe discomfort. <laughs> well, I think that's the difference between having image guidance throughout treatment versus not. I mean, if you don't have real-time image guidance, you have to have confidence in your immobilization. But if you do, then uh, it's a different uh, story. I have uh, two questions for Dr. Soberg. It's uh, uh, regarding the RTOG0236. So the first one is about the field size requirement. Uh, do you think it's okay uh, to use the uh, MLC to make the field size smaller for smaller uh, lesions? You have to understand the implications of doing that, and um, that is for very small fields, you lose lateral electronic equilibrium, and so your dose to the central axis actually decreases. Um, if you've got a good algorithm that's capable of predicting those things, um, it's possible, but you'll still underdose um, the periphery. You, you need a bigger field size than you think you need for the small lesions. So uh, by field size, you mean like effective field size, not just the, the draw position? The MLC position. MLC. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the second question is about the uh, homogeneity correction. Uh, the protocol states that not using homogeneity correction, so do you have any I'm comments? I'm so glad you asked that. That was the fault of uh, Brain Lab and CyberKnife. Um, at the time the protocol came out, um, those vendors had pencil beam algorithms, and it turns out that if you correct in lung with a pencil beam algorithm, you make things much worse than if you just assumed tissue homogeneity. And so, but at the time, most people who would want to participate in that protocol had a cyber knife or had a brain lab system of some sort. And so in order to accommodate everybody, they just prohibited any um, corrections. You'll note that in 0813, which is a new protocol for centrally located lesions, heterogeneity corrections are required, providing you use, have the correct algorithm, which means a AAA, a collapsed cone super, uh, collapsed uh, superposition convolution, Monte Carlo. Um, so that's the reason that 0236 was like that and that 0318 has been updated. I might, I might add to that that there is another um, trial called the STARS trial. It's out of MD Anderson, um, where there, it's a randomized trial randomizing resectable lung cancer patients early stage between surgery and CyberKnife treatment. And in that case, um, the CyberKnife centers are required to submit both the ray tracing uh, dose calculation as well as Monte Carlo. In fact, 0236 required that as well. You had to, you had to plan on homogene, homogeneous uh, calculation, but you also submitted the other one. And 06, man, what's the second one? 0618 is the RTOG study similar to what Mary, Mary Ellen mentioned. That's for operable patients, SBRT for operable patients. I have a question for Paula. Um, you mentioned that you, you do background on your radiochromic film on every piece of film. I'm wondering what kind of variability you see and, and, and how significant it is on the analysis that you're doing. Oh, very little, actually. But the reason I did that is because when I did my first measurement of the output factors, I, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't agreeing. So I try to think of all the things that could be affecting the answer, and that was one of them. So I fixed that in subsequent... Uh, measurements, but it didn't make much difference. Right. It really is very small, but now I'm in the habit of doing it, so I do it all the time. Uh, 
All righty then. Seeing no other questions, I, I thank the, the presenters uh, very sincerely, and I thank you guys for uh, your attention and your interest.